The results are in. This time on Poll Hub, we're checking in on the election results in Minnesota and Wisconsin, two states we polled about a month ago. And we're going to see how things turned out. Then CNN's Harry Enten, one of our big friends here, joins to talk about why he asked us to measure Donald Trump's approval rating on a different scale than the one most pollsters use. What is he thinking? Finally, would you pay for a poll? One organization thinks you might. We'll discuss it. Let's get started. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Poll Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper, Director of Innovation here at the Marist Poll. And I'm Lee Marengoff, Director of the Marist Institute for Public Opinion. And I'm Mary Griffith, Executive Producer of Poll Hub and Media Director for the Marist Poll. And I'm happy to be here sitting in for Barbara Carvalho today. Yay, Mary's back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We like Very it. high ratings last time. We, Th- that is. It's yes. all about the ratings. Absolutely. We talked to Donald Trump. He said you're uh, highly rated and therefore you're going to be back uh, as often as possible. Fake news. <laughs> <laughs> so many Minnesota and Wisconsin, we did a poll uh, about a month ago now where we looked at Michigan, we looked at Wisconsin, Minnesota, and, and Michigan, the, the primaries were uh, last week, so we revisited, you know, how'd we do, checked in and all that. Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, actually got a lot of attention when we did the polls for a whole variety of reasons, uh, mainly because some of the results that we saw in our polls, some people thought were, were kind of, wow, how could that possibly be, especially around Scott Walker, mm. the governor, the kind of lightning rod governor, Republican governor of Wisconsin. So, how do we do? What were the results uh, that happened on Tuesday compared to what we had seen a month ago? And let's keep that in mind. We were polling in the field roughly a month before Election Day. So why don't we start in Minnesota? In Minnesota, uh, according to our NBC News Marist poll, as Lee pointed out a few weeks back, in the Republican gubernatorial primary, we had Tim Pawlenty up over Jeff Johnson. And that, as we'll discuss in just a few moments, that was a really big surprise uh, in, in the results itself. Looking to the Democratic Farmer Labor gubernatorial primary, we had Lori Swanson just up slightly um, over Tim Walls, who was the victor in the primary, but that was very, very close, very competitive. We had Aaron Murphy um, at 11%. That was about 13 percentage points lower than Walls, who we had in second place. Let's take a look over um, to Wisconsin. Our NBC News Marist poll results in the Republican Senate primary We had Kevin Nicholson. Again, this is among the uh, potential uh, Republican electorate. He was up over Leo Vukmir by 10 percentage points. Important to note, when we drilled down into likely voters, Nicholson was up only 3% over Vukmir, who was the victor. And um, that was very competitive as well. So I think one thing that's important to note is there were big undecideds in a couple of these. There's yes. a large chunk of undecideds. It was a month out, and some of these races were close. But let's let's talk about the the, the elephant in the room here. Tim Pawlenty, sure. a, what was believed to be a, for, a, a he was former governor mm-hmm. of uh, Minnesota, popular was believed to be popular, yep. Yep. was running ahead in our polls and everybody's polls, pretty much, right? I mean, this is sure. a guy who. Uh, was expected to win, and he was one of the bigger surprises of the season. What what happened? Not that yeah, anybody no, no, missed no, no. again, it was a month yeah, out, but yeah. uh, why a month ago what, what, were voters saying they liked him and they strongly supported yeah, him, yeah. and then he lost by, um, you know, uh, nine points? Yeah, well, you're talking, I think, general name recognition and then people who might vote in a primary, so uh, we really weren't getting into likely voters as much. And also, uh, you know, Johnson, the winner, uh, there was a strong... Trump factor in there, which I think was playing uh, against Pawlenty and, uh, and 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 leading in. You know, we've seen that in Republican primaries around the country and in, in some special elections as well. But mostly in Republican primaries, the, the you know Trump is having a big influence at least within Repu- with Republican voters. But I think this also you know sort of asks the question, you know, how do we use a poll a month out to help navigate what's going on? And I think both of you have already alluded to you know these were high undecided uh, at that point, and that's not surprising in a primary. Uh, and I think that that's uh, you know something that suggests that you're not necessarily looking for a predictive kind of thing, which you might be looking like in the last week, but here you're looking at, you know, who has the intensity? Do likely voters move it in the Palente case? I mean, the likely voters did shrink his lead, so that was sort of a, a uh, an indication. A warning sign, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think also, you know, in, in a couple cases, I mean, Laurie Swanson in um, uh, Minnesota, I mean, that, that campaign was just a bad campaign, and, and that does happen, and, you know, she sort of, you know, uh, gated, as it were. Right. Also, you look at the strongly support. We asked the question, do you strongly support, do you somewhat support, might vote differently? 
And Lori Swanson had 25% of her supporters said they might vote differently. Yeah, and so. really more to the point, Tim Walz had 40, 39% who said they strongly supported yeah. him. That was 13 points higher than yeah. Lori Swanson. So, so there you see, when you drill down, you're seeing things that, that might be uh, might turn out to be real. And again, our undecided was at 37% yeah, in that so, race. Yeah, so, so it's not very predictive. But, but uh, you know, I think also what these polls are showing early on is we see uh, about enthusiasm, uh, people who are, you know, think these primaries are important, and that really is showing up in the votes as well. So the Democratic enthusiasm in these states, Minnesota especially, but also Wisconsin, the turnout uh, really reflected the fact that Democrats are much more connected to all this. And I think part of that has to do, you know, Donald Trump's approval rating in an area that, you know, really was the, the turning point for him in 2016. Uh, you know, this region uh, just is not going Trump's way right now. One of the things we were talking about uh, that we were criticized for was the waiting by party. We were accused of waiting yes, by party. Yes. Oh, you have too many Democrats yes. in your poll. Well, uh, and, and we just addressed that, and we talked about how we basically ask voters what are you? We're, yeah, we're not sure. waiting. And here's what I found really interesting, because that, the, the criticism was most intense uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and if you look at the 993, 94,000 voters who turned out for the primary, um, remember there was a competitive Democratic primary. Tony Evers ended up winning, as we mm -hmm. had uh, seen in our poll. And Scott Walker was running against nominal. He's the incumbent, was running against nominal opposition. 54% of the voters who turned out voted in the Democratic primary to 46 for the sitting governor. That's an indication that this split that we saw, where there were more independents saying they're independent, more Democrats saying they're de Democrat than Republican, turned out to be the case. In Minnesota, that was wildly, it was so far in that direction. 65% of the people who showed up for two competitive primaries, there was a Republican Democratic primary, super competitive, governor's race, 65% of the voters were voting in the Democratic primary. Wow. If that doesn't speak to the enthusiasm level, Just I don't know what does. Enormous. And I think there's one number in all of our polls that I, I, you know, I think was probably the most telling, and that is the Scott Walker re-elect question among registered voters statewide at 34%. So Walker is sort of entering this race right now for the general election with a very, very steep incline, uh, uphill fight for him uh, if he wants to stay in the state house. And as we approach and get closer, of course, there'll be more primaries coming up in the next couple of weeks. We'll definitely have more polls out, which we'll be discussing on upcoming episodes of Poll Hub. And joining us right now, Harry Enton of CNN, uh, formerly of 538, a friend of the Marist Poll. You've been to campus and you've been on our program as well, podcast. And you are, believe it or not, Harry, our first returning podcaster. So that is a distinction you can pass around to all those who you might be competitive with. You are first. Anyway, Harry, thanks a lot for, for joining us. And let's get to the point here about the poll on Donald Trump. Uh, you requested something from us. We were very happy to accommodate. What were you looking at? What, what, was, uh, what was getting you uh, interested in, in Trump's approval rating? Well, first, let me just say that I'm going to get a fudgy to whale to celebrate my <laughs> second appearance and being the first one to do it. No cookie puss? <laughs> no cookie puss. I'm a fudgy the whale type of guy. <laughs> Um, but let's also talk about the poll itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so essentially what I was most interested in and what we know about Donald Trump is it's not just that more people disapprove than approve of what Donald Trump's doing. It's the intensity of the disapproval. And the way that we normally ask that question today is do you strongly approve or strongly disapprove of a politician? But that question has not historically been asked over a long period of time. And the Harris poll, which is still around, although perhaps in a smaller form than it used to be, did ask a question about approval ratings that tried to get at intensity back in the day. The way that they asked about it was they said, OK, do you believe that the president or any politician is doing an excellent job, a pretty good job, an only fair job or a poor job? Unfortunately, that question had not been asked during the Donald Trump administration. Mm -hmm. But this poll, in fact, did that. And when we did ask that question, what we found was that 20% of Americans rated Donald Trump's job performance as excellent. 20% said pretty poor, pretty good. 13% said only fair. And a very large 45% said poor. And what I did was I went back in time and compared that poor percentage to other presidents. And what we found is that poor percentage 
is really, really high compared to other presidents at this point in their presidency and also to one special president at a point in his presidency when he was at his lowest point, Richard yeah, Nixon. And, and I thought, just looking at the numbers, one of you know, my apprehensions, I don't know if that's the right word, in doing that question uh, was that what if the excellence in pretty goods combined to something very different than Trump's approval rating. And it turns out the combination was 40%, which is about what he's doing. So that gave me a sense that this question had great validity and then also the added benefit of measuring the intensity, which you uh, point out. So so I think it, it, it worked from a method standpoint, and it certainly was interesting, I think, from a, just a news value uh, to try to understand a little bit more about what Donald Trump is about. So I thought that was kind of like a win-win. Yeah, exactly. And, and what I would say say is, you know, just to dig in a little bit deeper into the numbers, you know, when you look at Richard Nixon, who at the height of, you know, all of his troubles, a week before he was forced to resign, 45% also viewed him as poorly, uh, said his job performance was poor. But of course, what Donald Trump has going on both sides of the aisle is a lot of intensity, both negative and positive. But at this point, the, the high negatives are outweighing the high positives, and that, to me, is a major sign of trouble as we sort of head into November. Yeah, Harry, you mentioned in your article this sort of love-hate relationship in D.C. politics in terms of the intensity of Donald Trump and his approval rating. So would you talk a little bit more about the significance in terms of the midterms? Yeah, I, I, I think when you're looking at intensity in a midterm election, remember, midterms have lower turnout than presidential year elections. And the question is, what would make someone turn out in a midterm that they might not otherwise turn out in? And I think that the intensity question, if you really like someone or really hate someone, that would make you more likely to turn out. I've been working on some preliminary um, data sets that do show that, that it does seem that people who strongly dislike a president are more likely to turn out in a midterm election. And indeed, if you look at where Trump's approval rating is right now, if you're looking at the poor percentage, 45 percent, and you see that Richard Nixon had that same 45 percent in August of 1974, you saw in that midterm election, Democrats gained, you know, a ton of seats. And it, in fact, right now, the predictions are that Democrats will gain as many seats in this midterm election. Obviously, predictions can change and numbers can change. But the Democrats are looking potentially to pick up as many seats in a midterm election. Uh, this would be the largest number since 1974. So is it your sense in, in politics, or at least among likely voters, is love stronger than hate or hate stronger than love? <laughs> I think that hate is stronger than love. I think that we live in a negative partisanship age. You know, if you dig into the political science literature, what you see is that Democrats are Democrats more so than ever because they hate Republicans, not necessarily because they <laughs> love Democrats, yeah. and the same on the Republican side. I mean, Donald Trump, as a president, right, is someone who really capitalizes on hate and visceral politics and tries to stir up negative emotions within his own fan see, base. See, that's why Hillary Clinton ultimately had a problem, because she was going around saying, love Trump's hate. <laughs> and obviously she wasn't right. <laughs> Exactly. I think that you, in this day and age, what you really need to, what the political science literature shows us and what the numbers tend to indicate is that what you want is to build up dislike of the other side. I know, you know, there's all that fancy stuff that goes on. Oh, where are your ideas? You should be for something, not against something. Yeah. But it's. It doesn't seem to actually work that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so what do we expect out of you from CNN? We see on TV a lot. We're reading about what you're writing and all those things. What do you have in store for us for now, between now and November? What are you working on? I mean, what I think essentially we're working on is obviously is it's going to be a sprint to the midterm elections, especially from Labor Day onward. And I'm going to try and cover the numbers um, or cover the races from a numbers perspective. I think that we're going to do a lot of interesting products uh, that will be coming out, you know, on the House and on the Senate. Uh, and I think, you know, look, these types of stuff that we're doing have been done before, but I don't believe that they've necessarily been done in a major news network before. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be careful. We're going to try and be uh, as cautious as possible, but try and give the audience a better understanding of where the races are from a 
statistical perspective. Yeah, I think one of the takeaways from 2016 certainly was, you know, to try to have the the, the better understanding about how we can deal with uncertainty uh, from a polling standpoint and from a communication of that to our audience. So I think that would really be awesome if you can make some progress in, in that regard. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, you know, if you look back at the polling in 2016, yes, in the states, perhaps, you know, granted there were a number of states where it didn't get polled at the very end, but the state errors were perhaps a little larger than normal. The national polls were very good, but I think that there was a real injustice done to the audience because of the way that those numbers were being portrayed and that it was portrayed that Hillary Clinton's lead by a number of different journalists was more impenetrable than it actually was if you looked at the numbers and compared it to where they were historically. And so I think my job, as I view it, is to be able to pass along to the reader and to the audience, the viewer, so on and so forth, where there really is uncertainty and how certain can you believe, you know, that the Democrats are up, you know, say we project that the Democrats are going to win the House by 10 seats, how certain can you actually be in that projection? All right, Harry, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, probably the biggest uh, midterms in, in any of our lifetimes here coming up, although post-Watergate was a pretty big one too, but I think this probably matches that. So a lot of work to do, and we'll be looking at what you're doing and uh, sharing what we're doing with you, and I'm sure we're going to have you back on, because you're going to be maybe the third uh, or the third, uh, the first guest to come on the third time. <laughs> and then you'll have to figure out what you eat in celebration for that. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. Flying saucers, by the way, flying saucers. <laughs> <laughs> He's already. He's ready. He's ready. Thanks, He's, Harry. Okay, Harry, be good. Take care. We'll talk soon. Thank you. All right, have a good one, guys. Yeah, bye-bye. In past episodes of Poll Hub, we've discussed the cost of polling and how due to various technology and emerging, emerging technologies, technologies rather, the cost of polling has increased. Well, our good friends over at Rasmussen have a new project that they've put forward. It is a citizen-sourced national midterm election polling project. And basically, their goal is to uh, provide voters with what they're calling independent, unaffiliated, battleground state polling. And they're using GoFundMe to raise money. Um, people can go to GoFundMe and can contribute certain amounts. They can pick whichever state that they'd like to, um, that Rasmussen has identified, to which they can send money, contribute, to offset the cost of polling. So, Lee, is this a good idea? Uh, I, yeah, I think, first of all, uh, the Rasmussen operation has always been one of, as we, we, you know, we got controver been controversial to uh, pollsters polling and uh, in the field and the like, and, and I think this got everybody's eyebrow. You know, oh, my God, what, what are they up to? And then when we thought about it a little bit, we thought, that's not such a terrible idea. I had intended to do GoFundMe for the Lee Marigoff Vacation Fund. Uh, <laughs> but now I'm thinking, hmm, not bad. Uh, so b bottom line is, I mean, you know, as long as these people are not then included in the poll in any way uh, in terms of being, uh, you know, surveyed, then, then I think, you know, it's a way of getting people engaged if they want to do it. I, I don't think there's a problem with that. Maybe we should have thought about this first. And I do want to point out that Rasm Rasmussen notes that they will not profit from this, yeah. and that uh, funds that are not used will uh, be even will go evenly between ProPublica and Reason. Okay. I think one thing that's interesting here is that it raises the issue of the cost of polling, which mm -hmm. is not something we've discussed a whole lot yeah. here. Um, can you just walk the audience through the kind of briefly? how polls get paid for because they're not cheap. The kind we do are very expensive because yeah. it involves calling people on cell phones and landlines and calling a lot of people in order to get the representative sample that we seek. Others use other methods, but yeah. they're not cheap. None no. of them are no, cheap. No, it's, it's all so who pays expensive. for this? I don't think we've really ever discussed yeah, that. Yeah, and I think the problem with, the, with the, the cost is that then you get lots of varying quality in polls, which we have talked about. But uh, you're right. I mean, this is not a, not an inexpensive undertaking. Um, you know, we're, we are supported by the college. A lot of college-based polls are supported by their colleges, uh, thankfully, and I think that's just a great educational tool uh, that we do. I mean, we're essentially an educational program with a public relations component to it, uh, not the other way around. And so I think that, that that's an awesome thing for students to have the opportunity uh, to do. Um, in terms of cost, uh, other people, we we have uh, media we have partners. Media partners. We have NBC media partners, NBC News, which, NPR, which helps, PBS, which helps with that as well. Um, and some of this is done for 
publicity reasons. Some of this for other people who are doing it. Uh, you know, it's part of a business, uh, and you know they do other polls, and this becomes a sort of like a, a visible thing. Gallup poll which is known for the Gallup public poll, is actually a major corporate pollster. Yeah, how do they pay for their public and, and they And they do get the money from their private clients. Right. And some people do subscriptions to get to the poll so people can get the information first. There's a whole bunch of ways of kind of offsetting what are growing costs, um, and that becomes a problem for the so, field and for the industry. So Rasmus has basically turned around and say, look, it's expensive to do this. If you don't want a media partner, if you don't want all this, if you if you don't if you can't or you don't want that, and the public wants you know polling done, wants to yeah. see polls, and there's a huge appetite for it. Well, maybe the public would like to pay for and, it. And I think the question is, you know, is he going to raise substantial money from this? Is the organization going to do that? And if so. They have to, in their uh, discussion of the poll, indicate sponsorship uh, so that we know that. And we did check in um, at, on their website, and this project really isn't gaining too much traction. As of now, we'll keep tabs on how they're doing. Um, they have a goal of $2,000 per state, and there's not been, again to date, not overwhelming response that most states have one or two contributors. Um, so perhaps the public feels there's you know enough midterm polling. Again, we'll keep we'll keep and checking. They, they may think that. it's a gimmick. I mean, I, I think that's also possible, and they may be holding on to for my vacation they're, fund. That's they're, possible. Their turnary is two thousand dollars. St- How much yeah, polling see, can I'm you not, do in a state? Well, for $2, keep in mind, and I think it's important to point out they do a lot of IVR uh, in, in, interactive voice yeah, response so methods. IV, IVR is what. Not just in a, what, what does that mean? Yeah, it, it, in other words, it's not real people talking to real people. It's they still a, use the phone. A, yes, they do, and that's so a landline. Kind of, that's landline only. And right. then for their cell phones, they're using non-probability online panels. So they have ways of kind of like keeping costs to a minimum. We think we have. I mean, we would have problems with that methodology in terms but of. But they can poll a state even with those methods for two thousand bucks. I don't know. That I seems I, like seems, they must be subsidizing somewhat because you, you, two thousand bucks, you can't even buy coffee for the team. Well, they that. probably have an ongoing sample, I'm thinking, that we have not including coffee. in that. I think these are incremental. I think these are marginal costs above and beyond for that particular project. I think that's probably how they're counting it. But anyway, that's, that's I, where it's I do think it's cool, though, that it raises the issue that polling isn't free. It doesn't come without uh, a cost, and that cost needs to be borne by somebody. Media organizations are less and less likely to pay for quality polls because they have budget pressures. Yep. And so it falls to nonprofits like yep. universities and colleges yep. and a few others to do this. So it's an interesting attempt to try and get the public engaged. As you point out, though, Mary, uh, it may be a steep hurdle to get them to donate to something that they don't necessarily like anyway. Well, we wish them the best of luck. <laughs> yes, indeed. That'll do it for this edition of Poll Hub. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll here at Marist College in lovely Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith is not only our executive producer, but she was on the show today, as you heard, doing a great job. Also, Kenny Marples is our editor now, officially, so if there's any problems with it, just you know, email him and say, hey, I don't know that that worked too well. I'm just kidding. It's going to be perfect. It's all Kenny's fault. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 what that's what uh, uh, interns uh, are usually for. In this case, though, Kenny is much more than. But that, as so. an editor, he can take what he wants and omit. This could uh, be he just, could yeah. oh he could make us look like yeah. Or he can just voice over everything. Can, let's Kenny. start all over then. Hey, and Kenny Marples is our editor. He's a great guy. <laughs> Kenny is our phenom, and also phenomenal are our friends at the Roper Center Archive at Cornell University. We'd like to thank them as always. They provide us with the ability to take that look back in time at survey questions and see the results over the decades. And we encourage you to send questions to us at pollhub at maris.edu. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us on social media. We're at Maris Maris Poll on Twitter, Maris Poll, Facebook. Did I say Maris Poll? I did say Maris Poll. And don't forget, folks, you can subscribe. There's a button. Press it. It makes every life so much easier. We enjoy having you uh, partake in this. Let's hear from you. Thanks.